Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Jacked Up Gardening. Joining me once again is Mason Day. Um, and I think we can all agree that our gardens are thriving right now with flowers in full bloom and vegetables that are waiting to be picked every day. Um, tis the season of giving your neighbors your overabundance of produce, whether they want it or not. <laughs> That's funny you bring that up, Caitlin. Uh, I actually just, you know, I've, I've been harvesting a ton of zucchini. I definitely planted way more than I need. Uh, and so I think that everybody that I've seen in the last two weeks has gotten two or three zucchini. I even keep trying to give it to my neighbor, uh, but he's currently having his house remodeled. So he was like, kind of like politely was like, I don't really have a kitchen right now. Um, so yeah, so even he doesn't want my zucchini anymore. But speaking of squash and tomatoes and all that goodness, uh, can we talk about some preventative care, you know, to help deter uh, one of those pos uh, pesky, uh, popular summer letdowns, you know, that all of us gardeners are leery of, and that's blossom end rot. And, yeah. uh, you know, before we got on here, Caitlin, I was telling you that I had a little bit uh, showing on some of my tomatoes, so I am familiar with that. Yeah, for sure. So squash, tomatoes, and peppers can be victims of this frustrating phenomenon <laughs> that, that happened this time of year. And there's nothing more disappointing than having a beautiful, healthy plant that sets gorgeous fruit just to watch the bottom of the fruit rot out. So for a brief review, um, the finger gets routinely pointed at calcium when blossom end rot sets in, um, which is true. But let's be clear, you know, it's most likely not a calcium deficiency, but more of a calcium standstill within your plant as calcium is an immobile plant nutrient, meaning that it does not freely move within the plant itself. So this is where proper management comes into play with how you care for your plants. Yeah, and that's where for a long time people would always say just add more calcium, add more calcium. And, you know, that really wasn't the problem. And new studies have, have shown that, you know, the problem really is in the the taking up of the calcium and, uh, you know, not to get too sciencey, uh, but basically the conditions in the soil have to be correct for that that plant uh, to take up the calcium and not just the soil, but just the plant itself. And that's why to minimize the effects of blossom and rot, you know, you really have to minimize the stresses that the plant is going through. Uh, you know, some studies have shown that if, if a plant sees intense periods of uh, drought or dryness, you know, that could affect calcium uptake and inconsistencies, you know, in that moisture content, it, that's really what's, you know, causing that discouragement of the calcium to be moved and translocated throughout the plant and into the fruit. And so it's important to, you know, keep your plants well watered and not let them dry out too much between waterings. And I think that's what I ran into this season is I thought they were a lot wetter than they were actually. So I've been watering pretty steadily the last few days here as it's been pretty hot. Yeah, and a lot of it is too, you will see blossom and <clears throat> rot in those early fruits. So, I mean, don't worry, Mason, just take them off. Just pull the plant, pull the fruit and the next ones, you know. It's make so sure painful. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, but yeah, just monitor that moisture now. You'll be fine. They'll come around. Um, and another important step um, in preventative steps you can take for managing blossom and rot is choosing the right nutrients to use. And I know we've talked about um, our tomato feed before, but I'll say it again. Um, the 12, 15, 30 tomato feed is perfect for all those summer fruiting vegetables. We went ahead and incorporated that extra calcium in this formula to make sure that the nutrient is available for the plants to take up and use. Um, so once you apply it, you know, like Mason was saying, just manage that root zone moisture um, so it can be translocated through the plant into the fruit and, and blossom and rot should stay away. <laughs> Yeah, and absolutely. And that's where the first time I uh, I went out and saw some, you know, uh, some things that were happening with the blossom end rot, I, I busted out the tomato feed. Actually, that's where I, I just was, was uh, applying some tomato feed into those uh, raised beds of mine. And so, uh, and as you, I'll send some pictures and post them on this video as well. Uh, but also, you know, there are vegetable varieties on the market that are less susceptible to blossom and rot. And, you know, planting those varieties can help with some of those unwanted headaches. Uh, you know, for example, tomato varieties, Mountain Fresh, Mountain Spring, I think even Mountain Pride, I've got a bunch of those out there as well. They're, they tend to be uh, more resistant to those types of conditions and you'll see them less. And so, uh, so yeah, it comes down to a factor of, you know, a bunch of factors of things when it comes to blossom and rot. But uh, we try to do the best we can to help you out and make sure that the nutrients are there when you're 
plants and tomatoes want to take them up. And yeah, so what else? Anything else today, Caitlin? That pretty much wraps it up. I mean, if you have any questions, you know, reach out. I do have some really great fact sheets that some universities have put out on um, just further insight on Blossom and Rat. You know, we just wanted to cover the basics today and get everybody up to speed, um, which is some quick things they can try and manage differently to prevent this from happening to their plants. Um, so yeah, reach out info at jrpeters.com or drop us a comment section below and uh, we'll catch up with you all next time and happy gardening. <laughs> See ya.